there's only one thing that's important is the career. And for high achieving individuals, they tend to sacrifice the yeah. marriage for the business. For the or business. For the, one day he bought her um, a piece of jewelry. They bought a new boat and he got her a car. Having an affair with the son's basketball or football coach, mm. having an affair with the school principal, having right. an affair with a client. The worst one, having an affair with the husband's best friend or the wife's best friend. But I gave you the world. You had to not, you didn't have to work. You could buy whatever purse you wanted. You could go wherever you needed to go. You know, now it's my turn. He looks at his wife and he just grabs her hands and he goes, I get it now. <laughs> so their revenue increased while oh, he stood away to battle cancer. When the cancer subsided and he came back into the business, it was 10 times stronger because they both now were able to run the business, but more importantly, he became a better leader. In this episode of Headspace, my friends, my brothers and sisters, you will enjoy an amazing conversation with an award-winning marriage counselor, Chris A. Matthews. We cover a variety of subjects and stories. He's an author of a bunch of books. He does amazing work. I'll put some links in the show notes. But before we do, please, please subscribe. If you're in a podcast, leave us a review, give us a star, spread the word. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it very much. Hey, definitely. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, I've been following your stuff, and it's fantastic. Uh, high quality. The insights are amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I just... I'm very excited about getting into conversations about marriage, the importance of marriage, how crucial it is. Um, and a specific, I have a specific question for you. I already told you what it was. But uh, can you give us a little bit of a background on how you got into this, this field of, of marriage counseling first? So I got into the field of marriage counseling when I experienced a tough marriage for myself. And that started out young. My wife and I were in undergrad in college. We've been together actually 17 years and we were dating and within, uh, you know, a year we were pregnant with our first son. And I went to my school's university counseling center at the time and looked around and there was no one in there that looked like me. There were no men, there were no persons of color. So I did what a lot of Christians do. I go to my pastor and my pastor did a great job of supporting me through prayer and, and, and mentorship, but he wasn't a licensed trained therapist. So he didn't want to practice outside of his scope. Mm. But at the time, therapy wasn't as popular as it's starting to be now. So there wasn't a referral to a clinician. I then go home to my wife, a new baby, and I'm struggling. We're, we're, we're going through a tough time, there are arguments, there's threats to leave. At the time, we weren't established in our careers. We hadn't graduated yet. There was no employment, so money was tight. And we just figured it out the hard way. And that looked like reading different material. We, we studied a lot of different programs. We did the, the D.A.R.E., the uh, Love D.A.R.E., Fireproof. Uh, we read John Gottman's books. We read Dr. Gary Chapman's Five Love Languages. And from this process, after about five years of just putting that work in, we look up one day and we're like, hey, we made it. And uh, I wanted to then go back to school and get a master's degree so I could help other couples that were young and new to marriage like myself and my wife were. And that's what got me into the field. Uh, you know what? I always, uh, it amazes me. The people who make it are people who try. I mean, bottom line, right? Like the fact that you actually went and read everything you could put your hands on, that's fantastic, man. That's just, that's the way it is. Look, you want, how desperate are you to fix this, whatever it is that, that, that it is? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, I think you're, I think it's amazing that you, you did what you did and you saved a marriage and now you can, you can help many others. Right. And being young and doing that too was tough. You know, we were in our, in our early 20s, I think we we're actually 19 at the time we could see. 20 by the time my son was born um and it was just tough it you know marriage is not for the week <laughs> right? no it's not it's, it's not for the week at all and it's not for the prideful 
you know, there was a lot of ego that had to be dropped, a lot of pride that had to mm-hmm. be de-escalated. And yeah. when you are, and, and I would say to those listening, the biggest thing that helped me and my wife, now being a clinician, the verbiage is, is an attachment wound. That's the name of, um, you know, what, what I'm describing. But the attachment wounds are usually when a partner will either say or do something that creates a pretty big ripple within the relationship. So it could be obviously like your big ones would be cheating on your partner, but it could just be something that you say. I I recall in Will Smith's book, he talked about his first marriage. He knew it was over when he said to his his first wife, he said to her that she wasn't worth anything. And I'm paraphrasing, but he said through all of the life regrets, that was his one regret, regret to have said something that hurtful to his, his partner. Oh and I just gosh, yeah. was so blessed and thankful my wife and I, throughout our journey, we, we we didn't make it worse than what it already had to be. It's already tough being young and married, but we didn't say or do anything that could have just destroyed any hope of building on a foundation together. So tell me about um, the correlation between people making it in, in life, in business, making more money, having more prestige, and an increased risk of divorce. How does, I mean, it seems to me that these things correlate in opposite directions, right? They tend to. So why is that, why is that, why is that happening, happening in general? And then how do you fix that? So the correlation of business and marriage, there are several parts. The first one most people are curious about is the financial gain or the ability to be successful when it comes to earning income. And there is a marriage wage premium. Married individuals make more money over the course of their lifetime. Married men can make up to 40% more than single men. And the correlation of marriage and business aligns with the characteristics that it takes to have a strong and healthy marriage. And if we look at those characteristics, they are parallel to business. The first one is discipline. Every successful business owner, every successful high achiever will tell you their discipline. When you think about an athlete, uh, you know, you, you being a musician, when you think about any person out there that we would consider successful, discipline is at the top of the list. The same with marriage. The second is a commitment to make it no matter what. Marriage is just in simplistic terms, a commitment. You're choosing to say, no matter what, I'm going to make it work out. And those two fundamental pieces align in business and in marriage. So when you find people that can be successful in marriage, they're usually going to have that success transfer over to business. And if you are listening and have issues within your relationship, there's help. That's what counselors are for. When you think about a team of people you need to be successful, you have a publicist, you have someone helping you with your style potentially, you have someone helping you practice, you have a coach, you have a legal team, you have all these individuals that come together to help you become successful. And the same with marriage, reach out to your spiritual leader, reach out to a counselor, reach out to people that have been happily married to obtain advice from those individuals. When you are willing to put those things together, discipline, commitment, and establish yourself with a good team of people, you're gonna be successful in business and you'll be successful in marriage. So so this is actually fascinating what you said, and I think it really makes sense. Look, if you have discipline, commitment, you you are, you're married to the right person and you're gonna, you say, we're gonna make this happen. That makes a lot of sense. Now, here's my trick question then. Okay. So if you're good, if basically what you're saying is if you're good in marriage, you're going to be good in business, right? Your game is going to transfer over. How come so many people that are so good in business are terrible at marriage? So I, I think that the, the opposite, right? Because you said usually you'll find someone that's great at business and then they can be, excuse me, someone that's good in marriage can be good at business. But why does the opposite not occur? And for high achieving individuals, they tend to sacrifice the yeah. marriage for the business. For the or business. For the yeah. 
That's that's basically it, right? That's the simple answer is that, man, that's terrible. And it's true, you know, mm -hmm. like being someone myself, I'd never, I've never lived through a divorce, thank God, but I've lived through enough heartache and enough heartbreak on my way because I was hyper-focused, for example, on, on my career in my, in my early 20s, right? Oh my gosh, it was just, it's, it's not even a question what's important. There's only one thing that's important is the career, right? Then any romantic relationships, anything like that is secondary, gets in the way, you just sweep it aside and, and keep going. Right. But with marriage, it's different because you've already committed. You've committed to that person. You said, you're going to be the most important person in my life. Mm -hmm. So, it's e well, well, to your point, it's easier to be good at marriage first and then be good at marriage. Right, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. So what's the uh, what what are some important things couple can do to just keep their marriage healthy? Like I'm talking about not someone at the edge of divorce like this is you know we don't know if we're going to make it but someone who's you know in the middle somewhere, right? Like we're we're okay but not flourishing right now and there's things in the way. So the National Marriage Project which is an institution based out of the University of Virginia they did some research around date nights and spending quality time with your partner. And they found that when surveying wives, 91% of wives stated they had a high quality marriage. And the correlation was they had significant time with their partner that was meaningful and intentional at least one time a week. So spending intentional time by way of a date night, or I like this, have a date day. I don't think a night's enough once a week. I think you need to just schedule an opportunity to be with your partner. And I and I recently posted an article that I wrote on LinkedIn, and the title was "The Most Important Staff Meeting of the Week Is Date Night." When you look at running your marriage like a business, that time you have to put the work and time into your business the same way you do your marriage. So if you are wanting to sustain a healthy, happy marriage, put the time in and be intentional about doing that. And a date night is an easy way to do that. The same study men were surveyed and men that spent intentional time with their wives once a week reported three times more gratifying intimate experiences with their partner. So quality time and intentional time is the number one thing that all married people can do to keep that marriage strong and healthy. That's amazing. I mean, that's simple. Simple enough, right? <laughs> like you go, you know what? I can fix that one thing. Everything else is downstream. That's fantastic. Yeah, and, and you think about what the whole goal of a relationship is, right? Like the marriage should be an enhancer. Right. The marriage should be something that adds more than what it takes away to your life. I tell couples when I do premarital counseling, if your partner is not going to add more than what they're going to take, mm -hmm. then you're better off by yourself. Yeah. So we don't want the marriage to be the thing that we put all our eggs in one basket for. We need to be happy outside of the marriage. Two positive people can create a positive marriage. And you're constantly changing. We're all constantly changing. Your marriage is constantly changing. The same way you update your cell phone, the same way you charge your phone at night, you have to charge that marriage daily. You have to update that marriage daily. And we can't do that if we don't spend time together. And yeah. my wife and I, we, we don't just preach this thing, preach this stuff. We, we, we actually practice it. Mm -hmm. We have a day, day once a week. Once a month, we have a, a, a sitter come in. We have three children. Our sitter comes in once a month and we pre-plan. Up until February, we have the sitter weekends already scheduled. And we do a date weekend once a month. In those moments, we're able to reconnect. Then once a year, we go on a trip together, usually out of the country. So that plan is established 12 months in advance. When you look at your business, you're putting together things on the calendar. You have to run your marriage the same way. And a lot of times people will say they want spontaneity. Structure structure breeds spontaneity. The spontaneity yeah. comes by knowing I have that isolated time with my partner. I don't have to rush. I don't have to feel like I have to move something else around in the schedule. It's part of the schedule. 
Yeah, I, I feel the same way. And, and actually, actually, I don't remember the last time. I don't remember the last time I've missed a date night with my mm. wife. I just don't. It's been years, basically. Every week, man. Every single week. Sometimes more than once a week. So, right. so, uh, but uh, but you're absolutely right, and it's 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 just intentionality. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Look, if you're intentional, it's going to be fine, right? Yeah. The let me ask you this: um, you've you've worked with people that are specifically sort of high achievers, people that are probably super busy, super ambitious, sometimes compli complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the ego is usually pretty high, that sort of stuff, right? Tell tell us, I mean, don't like rat them out, but tell us some stories, examples of the stuff that you've witnessed. And the reason I ask is not to pry, but really to illustrate. This is where it can go, you know, if you let if you don't pay attention. And so, some of the stories that come to mind, th there was a, a couple that we're going through life transition. He was a, a NBA basketball player and he had played in the league for 12 years. His wife and him met in college. So she had the identity of supporting her partner in the league. And once their time ended where he was no longer a professional basketball player, they both were lost they didn't know who they were without the game of basketball, without the lights, without the prestige, without the parties, without the travel. And I find that the couples that I work with, those life transitions, it could be, like you said earlier, you put all that time into running a business or getting a business off the ground. Now you have this money, but yet you left the marriage at the starting line. So, those stories are the same. And even couples who are now transitioning into being empty nesters, the children are going off. Yep. You find that same storyline. And when you talk about egos, it becomes a finger pointing contest. The first, like in the first example, the wife, she felt entitled, like, hey, I supported your 12, 13 year career, now it's my turn. And then he felt entitled, the ego was, but I gave you the world. You had to not, you didn't have to work. You could buy whatever purse you wanted. You could go wherever you needed to go. You know, now it's my turn to live. I was the one shooting those jump shots. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, so, you no, know, when you talk about ego, it's usually a power struggle. And in marriage, you're going to have those power struggles. So luckily enough, that couple was able to work through the process and they were able to be vulnerable and, and, and put the, the time in needed to heal. And they were not so egotistical, they weren't able to receive the therapy. They did their homework between session. And if you're looking to go into couples counseling, the therapist's job is to win that battle for structure. Right. So from the first session, I can see who the macho ego person is in the relationship and I have to win their trust. I have to let them know I'm not going to be a pushover, but at the same time, you'll have a voice in this room. You you have to have a voice in the room for the process to be successful. Right. Um, yeah. So those are usually some of the stories that I, that I encounter that transition, those power struggles, and you, you're married. So, you know, at times you, you get into your head, you start to think about how, the person doesn't take you for granted. <laughs> oh, you, you can you can get so insecure, right? right. Especially especially yeah. in times of transition, you can get extremely insecure exactly. about your identity. Are you lovable? Are you successful enough? Are you all of that, right? And uh, and uh, yeah, that's a vulnerable place to be. Very vulnerable place to be. So I had the opportunity to read your bio, and you spoke about how obtaining wealth and success at an early age. You then transition and you ask yourself, so what's next? Yeah. And when you're in a marriage or relationship, you and your partner have to continuously redefine who you are together, not just apart. They say every seven years, your marriage is going through a cycle. You yeah. personally, is, is, is that personally, a real thing, you think? It's the itch, the seven year itch. Is that a real thing in your experience? So, what I find um, that different stages in a marriage, the first year is the foundational work 
unfortunately, based on John Gottman's research, couples will go five to six years in a toxic negative space before they go reach out for help. Is that right? And yeah. So seven years is usually the time where people will need to redefine the relationship in marriage. But I believe you should look at redefining your marriage, your marriage relationship every day. That's I, right. It's a lifestyle. I use the example of um, there's a movie called Groundhog Day, mm-hmm. and the gentleman, you know, wakes up every day. It's the same day. His day starts over every day. Right. That's how you should approach marriage. You should approach your business that way. Every day, you need to start over again. You need new wins. You talk about the headspace, the mindset, having the mindset to start over every day and don't rest on your successes from the prior day. And um, in, in counseling, that's right. You know, share, share a story. A couple came in, and the, and the husband ended up. He was very wealthy, and he bought his wife. And one day, he bought her um, a piece of jewelry. They bought a new boat, and he got her a car. <laughs> right. And um, the next day, she's like, "So, where are we going to eat?" And he's like, "What do you mean we're going out to eat? I just bought you a car, a boat, <laughs> and jewelry." And she's like, "But." I have to eat today too, right? So oh, I, that's I funny. That's because funny. we have to eat every day in a relationship, right? We it doesn't it doesn't all come together. And I notice with men, um, we're really big on that that ego piece. Yeah. And it's not a bad thing. It's just we have to realize that the ego can get us in trouble when we start to think we're doing it all by ourselves. Can let me let's unpack this a bit. This is this is I'm very curious about this. Mm-hmm. what's your theory around the ego piece, right? Because obviously, I think intuitively, we've been around for a while. You've seen a lot of stuff. You understand that there's a positive side to the ego, and especially in, in gender roles, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and it could be... It, so it's, it's both healthy to a certain degree and destructive after, after a certain line that is passed... Um, what what's the line, I guess, and what's what are what are the dimensions of that? That's, I'm very curious about that, actually. The the line is isolation. When your ego is so strong, you look around; it's just you and the ego. The ego has pushed everybody out out of your life. Hmm. The ego has put you in a position where it's telling you you don't need anybody else. That's that's the line that gets crossed in relationships and marriages. The ego looks like when working with high achievers, one of the spouses may be the breadwinner or the, the, the one that accrues the most income. The other may be there's the house manager to navigate the children and the assistants and things of that nature. And the person who generates most of the ego, um, excuse me, most of the money, their ego kicks in and says, I don't need anybody else. I did all this by myself. That's the line that I see that gets crossed in marriages. To avoid that line being crossed, I strongly believe we have to be servant leaders and we have to be in touch with our spirituality. Our spirituality can be the guardrail to protect us from flying off the egotistical mountain. So speak to that a bit. What what what's the what's the role of faith in in sort of managing the ego, finding its place that is within the range of healthy and helpful, actually, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess the question, maybe it's somewhat related to sort of this ongoing conversation about masculinity and what is toxic masculinity and is all masculinity toxic or not? So I'm, you know, I'm, I may get pushed back for saying this. I, I don't believe that masculinity is toxic. I, I don't like that term. I believe masculinity is something that is beautiful. It's something that should be celebrated. I think it's something that gets a bad rap. I believe you have toxicity and toxic people, but we don't need to attach that anymore to masculinity. Uh, Masculinity is in correlation to, I believe, strength, confidence. When we think about the ego, I believe it becomes toxic once again when it isolates you from people. It isolates you from your higher power or from your spirituality. Because when we take time to sit down in prayer, meditate, 
we're connecting to something that's greater than ourselves. Maybe vibing off of you, your your ego, your strength, your masculinity is given to you so that you serve. Mm-hmm. And within a framework of serving and sort of a framework of submission to a higher power, um, it works. It's a blessing, right? The minute you start disconnecting yourself from both submission, you know, and humility, and from service, uh, masculinity can become start crossing into toxicity very easily, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, we we hear a lot about toxic masculinity, and that's a buzzword and term now. Mm-hmm. So in my program, when I was studying to become a marriage and family therapist, we as MFTs, marriage and family therapists for short, look at the feminist movement. We look at masculine and feminine energies. That's a part of our educational journey. And to understand that men and women and feminine energies, and those energies don't correlate with gender all the time. And what I mean by that is you can for example, look at a couple that are arguing, the person who is defensive, the person who is attempting to overpower the conversation or be more aggressive or heightened may in that moment exhibit a higher level of masculine energy. Uh And when you meet masculine energy with masculine energy, because it's needed. If someone comes into your home right now and you have to jump into the role of protector, yeah. of your family, that's where masculine energy needs to take its place. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, so masculine energy isn't something that doesn't have a place. It's when you don't have the offset of the masculine energy. Because if your partner is exhibiting that same level of energy and you meet that energy with masculine energy, you're going to be clashed. That's where arguments come in. Hmm. So I think about the gas pedal and the brake pedal, right? If yeah. masculine energy is the gas pedal, then let's allow feminine energy to be the brake pedal. We need both to run the car. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's very that's a very good. The imagery works for guys, especially gas pedal, right? <laughs> 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 so, so let me ask you this. I think um, you run retreats, right? Uh, in uh, special events like that, can you tell me why? Right? How does it help? How how is it not, for example, and this is sort of not to criticize because I don't know, but what I'm saying is how is that not a, a, an escapist Band-Aid type solution? What's what's sort of the long-term benefit of that if, if somebody joins one of your retreats? The, the retreats are one ingredient within a recipe. So the recipe is going to entail therapy and counseling. It's going to have the coaching components. You're going to also have workbooks in addition to online programming and then the retreat. So the goal of the retreat is to be that initial taste tester, to open couples up to the value of cutting life off long enough to focus on each other. Because the retreats are hosted by myself, who's a licensed clinician, and relationship coach, I'm going to also connect with other therapists and provide resources to coaches within your area. So wherever you come from, the goal of the retreat isn't to just be the silver bullet that fixes everything. It's designed to be the gateway so you can absorb all the other ingredients needed to develop and sustain a healthy relationship and marriage. And if you find anybody telling you that you're going to go to a retreat or you're going to read just one book or you're going to go to just one couple's counseling session or one coaching session and your marriage is going to be okay, they're not telling you the truth. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. So give me, give me maybe one or two stories of somebody going to a retreat, having an aha moment, a transformational moment. And then sort of sticking with it and seeing just complete turnaround of, of a relationship. Yeah, I'm sure so you have those, yeah. I do, I do. So one in particular I love. There was a gentleman that came into the retreat, and he was very combative and defensive. He felt like the relationship was perfect. 
and I and I have couples do this intervention. It's really simple. I have couples talk to each other, and one partner is the sender, and the other partner is the receiver. So it was his turn to be the receiver. The receiver's job is to be an empathic listener. The job of an empathic listener is to simply focus on hearing what your partner says. And he was in front. He he volunteered, by the way. He volunteered, he volunteered to come to the front of the room. So he, he was, was he was so disconnected from reality that he said, I'll do it. I, I got this, right? I got this. I'll do it. Right. And his wife shared, and I make sure the senders don't speak for more than about 15 to 20 seconds, right? Right. And after she spoke, his job was to be the, to, to regurgitate back what he heard. He couldn't do it. And in that <laughs> moment, and it was, it was really, it was really emotional because in that moment, the room goes solid. Wow. And he looks at his wife and he just grabs her hands and he goes, I get it now. Oh my gosh. And when he grabs her hands and says, I get it now, he was describing to the fact that he didn't see her. He could listen to the client. Right. He could listen to customers. He could listen to his employees. He could listen to his managers. He could listen to his, to his, to his publicists and all these people who helped build his career. But the one person he couldn't take time to listen to was his wife. And that's powerful. that was just such a groundbreaking moment. That's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, and I think, and I think, I mean, in, to me, what happens with in a retreat is that you, you sort of make space. I mean, you, geographically, you make space, right? It you you change your setting. You that itself dictates some intentionality, some clarity, some focus. So um, it's wonderful. So tell us more about the retreats you you lead and how do they look like, feel like, how many people, what's the setting, how many days, how many days, where do you go, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I, I I host gate I host getaways and retreats. Okay. So the retreats are more of your workshop fashion or form, and we tend to customize them based on the audience. So we never have in the retreats more than about ten to twelve couples. We keep it small and intimate. So uh, twenty to, to uh, you know twenty two people, twenty four people. Keep it keep it small. We don't have hundreds of people or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the process looks like building upon my book. The first pillar is safety. So we look at making sure that you have a safe and secure sound foundation. Then we transition into ensuring that both partners feel heard. And then we talk about understanding and last but not least, being able to express love and care. Right. So yep. those are the four yeah. pillars of the retreat. Now the, the getaways are intentional times that you and your partner can just connect. So I'll do an orientation, but leading up to the getaway, there's a 30 day email drip where you'll get an email every day, 30 days leading up to the get to the getaway, where it provides you and your partner opportunities for activities to conduct amongst yourselves. So when you go away to the getaway, it's just a major release of euphoria and excitement because for 30 days you've been intentional about building on that marriage. Nice, nice. And, and those are two different things. And, and you know, the getaways are for those that don't necessarily have any fundamental issues in the marriage. They just want to be intentional about creating time to reconnect. The retreats are designed for couples that have had some rough rough patches and they mm. want to be intentional about getting a jump start uh -huh. on their continued therapy or coaching. That makes sense. So, so the getaways are maintenance right right yes the retreats are damage control i guess right <laughs> yeah well the initiation we call it crisis management so whenever you come into counseling or therapy you're on fire usually there's been an issue there was a major blow up or there was ongoing days weeks sometimes unfortunately years where you were in a bad space so we got to get the momentum going we got to get some traction the retreats are designed to get you from being unstuck to the momentum of working toward progressing the relationship. And sometimes the retreats are designed to determine if you still are willing to put the work into the relationship. And and that can be disheartening to, yeah. to find that couples give up on the relationship. It's usually one wants to stay and work on it, and then there's another one that's just checked out. 
So can you tell? Yeah. Like, do you, do you have a sense of when you see somebody at a at a let's say a retreat, right? Obviously, mm-hmm. you're you're expecting pe- to pe- to see people in a in a bad sh- in bad shape, right? Do you have any? I mean, obviously, you can. I'm sure you can be mistaken. Anybody who is an expert in people, it's people are complicated. But are there are there signs or things that you go, oh man, this is not looking good? Absolutely, and. I cite a lot of John Gottman's work. Dr. John Gottman, based out of Seattle, he's been around for going on, I want to say 40 plus years as the, the top researcher in the field of marriage and relationships in, in the country, you know, maybe even the world. And he talks about the four horsemen. There are four different behaviors that if you find exist, it usually means the end is near. And those behaviors are contempt, having contempt towards your partner. Mm. defensiveness that's a huge one and then stonewalling that's a big one and then criticizing or or criticism that's the other one when those four characteristics are present based on Gottman's work and he has 90 percent accuracy over a 30-year span of predicting divorces based on those four characteristics so as a clinician who's also that's remarkable certified and trained in Gottman materials, when I find those four horsemen present, it's usually a sign that we're going to be in for a tough, tough journey. Right. Wow, that's remarkable. So repeat those again. So you have defensiveness, defensiveness, stonewalling and criticism, criticism. Okay. Interesting. That's fascinating. Actually, that's really, really fascinating. I mean, just those rates, 90% accuracy over 30 years. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I think he's done over 10,000 couples <laughs> and he's been able to predict those characteristics based on viewing couples within a 24 hour period. He had a lab he developed where couples would go for 24 hours and live and they would be under complete surveillance. Right. And his team of researchers watched those videos across 10,000 couples and found those four characteristics were present in 90% of the cases were couples divorced. That is absolutely remarkable. Yes. So, okay, so ima- I can imagine someone in the audience listening to the podcast or on YouTube going, uh-oh, I have like three out of four or something, you know, or four out of four. What would you tell them to do? Immediately humble yourself and identify a good marriage counselor you can you can see. And, and, I, and I say go to a counselor because you can become blinded by your own point of view and then your partner is blinded by their point of view. When you have a third party, when you have that person come in who's trained, they can help manage and mitigate those four symptoms because we all have them in moments in our relationship. Maybe not contempt. That one, Gottman acknowledged, is pretty much the biggest one that you want to be aware of. So that's heavily weighted on the contempt part, right? Contempt. When you have contempt, most of the time, that's the one that's the the backbreaker. Oh, my God. Yes. That makes sense, actually. We've all been defensive in a relationship. Yeah. I'm sure that's a common one. But the stonewalling, when you just tone your partner out, and then when you look at criticizing or, you know, the criticism, that's a big one, too. But um, don't panic. If you have these indicators, don't panic. There's help because there's help. Mm-hmm. you can get yourself in a better place if you're willing and committed to the process. The couples that I treat, the hardest part of my job is when I have people that aren't committed. And the process will tell itself, right? So if you go through counseling and your partner is choosing not to do the interventions, they're choosing not to show up on time or to show up at all, then they're communicating their level of engagement and commitment to you and the marriage. But if you have two partners that are committed, I've worked with couples that have cheated and have had affairs and have hurt each other, have gambled away money, substance abuse issues, a lot of different issues that I've seen come into counseling and couples have made it through it all. One in particular stands out. There was a couple I worked with and this wasn't actually just one time individuals who have affairs with 
their pastor or spiritual leader, have an affair with the son's basketball or football coach, mm. have an affair with the school principal, have right. an affair with a client. The worst one, have an affair with the friend's, the husband's best friend or the wife's best friend. Right. Those are all real examples. Mm. And despite the horrific nature, those couples still were able to make it. That's remarkable. Yes. And the reason why they were able to make it was because they grieved. They mm. had to terminate the first marriage and build a whole brand new marriage through right. counseling, through spiritual guidance. And that is tough. But those are some of the strongest couples I've ever met. That is so inspiring. That is so inspiring to hear. That's wonderful. Can, can I ask you this? Uh, and this is related to the to your beginning of your, the beginning of your story when you said, "When I came back, when I when I sought help, I I got some spiritual help with my pastor, but I couldn't find any counselors that were you know there was no one that was a person of color, right? You said mm -hmm. that. Now, do you think there's there's a cultural Cultural specific things in marriages, obviously beyond the basics, like the four horsemen. I mean, the, we're all human beings. And yet, there are different cultures. There's Eastern mm -hmm. European, European American. They're, we're all very different. African, very different. African from African American, very different mm -hmm. culturally, right? Absolutely. I grew up, I grew up yeah. in Africa, so I know, you know. Um, so, what do you, what are the, what are the dimension, what's the dimensionality when you look at a couple and you go, they're from the Caribbean, for example, or they're South American, or they're Eastern European. How does that work? Yeah, that, that's my favorite part of counseling. Yeah. <laughs> that is my favorite part of counseling because based on my training, we had to view everything through a contextual lens. And yeah. we looked at the cultural concerns or implications when working with couples. And I've seen so many different combinations Ethiopian and Russian, right? <laughs> like, it's just, I mean, you name it, Brazilian and um, Afghanistan, right? right. Like biracial just, couples are probably biracial like... Biracial couples. Yeah. And um, biracial couples are on the rise. The numbers are drastically increasing. Um, I don't want to misquote data, but I'm just speaking in, in terms of overall numbers. Every year, those numbers are drastically rising when it comes to interracial couples. And... What I find is that it's not just our race or the geographical location we were born and raised in, it's really the family of origin and how your culture impacts your development from a family lens. So for example, I'm working now with a couple, the male partners from Ghana and the female partner is um, African-American. So, you know, when you look at the couple, you see two black people, but Oh, yeah. Completely very different. different. Yeah. <laughs> very, very different. different. And, you know, one of the concerns I recall in the first session, she had this level of insecurity around the fact that a lot of men from his country had a wife prior to coming to the United States. So she she always felt like he was going to leave and go back to a potential wife that didn't even exist. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, and then he, he, and he came over to this country later in life. He was in his late twenties when he came over. So he oh, was, a, he was yeah. right. So you can imagine he was viewing African-American women through the lens of TV and entertainment. So. Oh, that's fascinating. You, right, you can think about how difficult that got at times in session. Oh my oh, gosh. Yes. Yes. Um, so those are moments that I live for because I become a student to the cultures. Oh, I have beautiful. to do my own research yeah. and learn. And, and that's why now I'm in this stage in my career where my goal is to travel the world and host retreats and conferences with local couples so I can expand my own knowledge of how culture impacts marriage. Okay, so if you're, yeah. if you're listening to this and you're doing something internationally, call... Uh, Chris Matthews and he, he, he I love it. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. I have a I have a I have a, a friend couple who are both African and one um was from Nigeria, the other one's from Ghana. Between Nigeria and Ghana, 
very, very different cultures, expectations, yeah. parents, layers, like even sort of the the, the rituals of of, mm -hmm. of courting. Uh, they told me stories. They were unbelievable and fun, the stories mm -hmm. that I heard from them. So I can only imagine the... You, you probably don't have boring sessions at, ever, right? No, nah, they're not boring, mainly because that's why I specialize in couples work, because it's, it's high intensity. Yeah. And I, I love the stimulation of couples work. A lot of clinicians treat everybody for everything. I only treat couples. And I'm fortunate enough to have a really strong team of other clinicians that I manage and supervise because I can make those referrals. It's very common that when I'm working with a couple, I'll refer them out to individual counseling amongst the clinicians that are already within our practice or other clinicians that I know to do good work. And, and that's, that's really fun because it gives me the opportunity to focus on the relationship with the client. Yeah. It's not two people I'm counseling. I'm counseling the shared space that they have together which is the marriage or the relationship. Yeah, that's fantastic. Tell me tell me about the, um, what is the difference? How do you navigate? Let's say you're a faith-based, you're a Christian, like we're a Christian mm -hmm. couple. When I counsel people in marriage, which we do as a pastor and my wife, um, we use scripture as our framework, right? Mm -hmm. um, how How do you, how do you counsel people that are in or outside the faith differently? If somebody is listening to this and they go, I don't know who to go to. I am a person of faith. Or maybe I am and my spouse is not. How do I navigate that? With faith, being that the scripture is the foundation, you use scripture to guide you amongst the principles with, within the Bible, right? Yeah. So, so a marriage and family therapist or a well, a well trained couples counselor, we're going to utilize modalities and theories. So, mm -hmm. our modalities and theories are approaches. I like to use the analogy of a golfer. Mm -hmm. A golfer selects the club based on where the ball lands. If you're teeing off, you use the driver. If you're close to the hole, you use the putter. A marriage and family therapist utilizes theories and techniques and modalities based on where the issues lie. So I use a lot of Sue Johnson's work, Dr. Sue Johnson, who wrote the book, Hold Me Tight. She modeled, or she authored a model titled EFT, Emotional Focus Therapy. I use that approach a lot. I use narrative approach or narrative therapy when couples are seeking to co-author their new story. I use cognitive behavior therapy if couples come in with thought distortions. So I'm selecting models based That's on remarkable. where the issues are. Wow. Right? Wow. I'm a Christian and I'm not a theologian like yourself. I don't know to how to recite scripture as well. But I open up my therapy room to hold all what that all of what that client needs to bring in. So if a couple wants to pray before a session, I'm open to that. I've had couples ask me, Chris. Can we pray before a session so God can come in and touch us all? Mm. Yes, no problem. And, and, you know, that's a very important thing to do to, to allow people to bring their faith into therapy. Therapy is not designed to separate you from your faith. It's designed to just be another ingredient to your faith. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Look, before we circle, I want to ask about what you're, what you're excited about, your new projects what the future holds for Chris Matthews, the international man of marriage. and uh, But before I do that, I want to circle back to one of the initial conversations when we talked about initial questions about, if look, if you're good at marriage, you're probably going to be better at business. Sometimes if you're good at business, you sort of ignore your marriage. You have the skills to make it work, but you ignore your marriage. Do you have any stories of, um, of couples fine-tuning, fixing, really rede rededicating themselves to each other in marriage, and that sort of propelling the careers and the, and the achievements of those people uh, to, a, to a level that they previously didn't even have. And the reason I ask is because I feel like my marriage propels me, right? Um, I, I, I devoted years and a lot of intentionality to building my marriage as the very core. It's the most important thing in my life besides God. 
And what I've noticed is that it made me into a better entrepreneur, investor, uh, pastor, everything, right? It's, I cannot imagine the things that I was able to do um, in professionally having, having the ability even to do those things without Deb and be, without our partnership together. And obviously, some of these things we started together, so we literally were co-founders of things, right? But just on a marriage level, uh, my, my marriage to Deb has been transformative for me professionally. Can you, do you have any stories that illustrate that, that thing that I'm talking about? And so there was a story in particular where one partner, he owned several different restaurants and his wife was a stay at home mom at the time. And this gentleman who run, ran these restaurants, he, he got sick and was actually diagnosed with, with cancer. And he had to go through chemotherapy. And prior to going through chemotherapy, they both were in a rough place in the marriage already. So they're in counseling and this man is going through chemotherapy. And from that process of marriage, his wife, and you'll love this because biblically speaking, we talk about one partner, the female partner being the helpmate. So his wife stepped in as the helpmate. But what we learned through that process, she was just as strong, if not stronger than he was, as the helpmate. She oh. was able to step up to the plate because she had observed how he ran those restaurants. She stepped into the leadership role. So the business didn't miss a beat. Oh, that's remarkable. And come to find out, the employees and staff actually liked her more than they liked him. <laughs> so their revenue increased while oh, he stepped away to battle cancer. When the cancer subsided and he came back into the business, it was 10 times stronger because they both now were able to run the business. But more importantly, he became a better leader because of the humility and the grace that overwhelmed him. Because going into the process, we had a session that was very volatile, not volatile physically, but just he had said some very horrific, mean things to her. He had prophesied that the business was going to fail and she wasn't going to be good enough and everything was going to crumble. And after he began to witness and see her growth, he obviously apologized, but the apology wasn't just, I'm sorry, to see this man with tears down his face and acknowledging that he wasn't in his mind worthy of her. He said, I'm not even worthy to be with someone wow. that's strong because she had to endure all of those negative com comments. She had to endure all that doubt and she still was strong enough to not only prove him wrong per se, but she didn't kick him while he was down. Oh, that's fantastic. And she wipes the tears off his face. And she said to him in that moment, she says, I'm your helpmate. That's my job. And mm. to see not only their business flourish, but the marriage flourish. The marriage is not only what kept him alive because she had to be there to reduce stress so he could get that treatment, but it was just so transformative to see how cancer birthed a better marriage and business for them both. That is a fantastic story. Wow. Wow. Well, final question. What are you up to? What are your what's what's a new what's coming down down the road for for Chris Matthews? Yeah, so this upcoming year, I'm I'm super excited about the engagements I'm going to be doing with several different churches around the country, the world, where I'm going to be speaking to uh, marriage, ma marriage communities within churches to help promote and establish the production of ongoing workshops. And those workshops will follow the template of the workbooks and materials that I've authored. And in addition to working with the churches, I'm also going to be presenting at several different conferences and seeking out additional opportunities to come into organizations and speak. And the goal is just to promote the new book as well that I have coming out and help as many marriages as possible. The new book is titled Out of Order, 
a young man's journey from marriage underdog to marriage expert. Yeah, it goes right. into a lot of the story that my wife and I encountered when it comes to having a healthy marriage earlier on in life. And each chapter has an underdog principle. I'm also highlighting that high achievers can overcome being underdogs when we put the intentionality toward the marriage. So speaking, promoting the new book, and helping churches establish strong marital ministries are the three big things that I'm going to be doing this upcoming year. Fantastic. Well, you have been a blessing and a treat to speak to, get to know. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the insights were remarkable. Um, guys, uh, follow Grace Matthews. What's the, is, is there a URL that you can give us? I'll, I'll add it's it to the, uh, to the notes as well. ChrisAMatthews.com. It's my Boom. name. Um, mm-hmm. Keep it simple. Several years ago, um, 20 years ago, my dad bought that URL for me. He did? <laughs> yeah. He said, I-, I found your name, ChrisAMatthews.com. And you know, he bought it. He was like, you're going to need this one day. <laughs> and sure That's enough, a good dad right there. That's fantastic. Right? Yeah. Ask for too. C-H-R-I-S-A, Matthews with two T's, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-S. And that's my handle on social media as well, Chris A. Matthews underscore for um, Instagram, LinkedIn, all, all of the social content, uh, Chris A. Matthews. Thanks, my friend. Uh, we'll definitely be following you. I'll be following you. You're a good man uh, doing good work. And um, I hope your year just explodes into uh, just transformation for marriages all over the world. Thank you. Appreciate that.